Kentucky. Want to tell all the dads in the room, happy Father's Day. Uh, we're proud of you and we're glad that you're with us today and hope you uh, grab your bacon on the way in. There's still going to be some bacon afterwards probably and so you're welcome to take as much as you want. We really don't care about your heart condition here, obviously, so just eat all the bacon you want. It'll be great. I have a $100 bill here. It's worth exactly $100. It's uh, This is a new bill. It's crisp. It's clean. It, it even smells like new money. It's awesome. All right? Now, this $100 bill is worth 100 bucks. What happens to its value if I was to bend it over and put a deep, long crease in it? Or if I was to crumble it up? You know, let's just... Make it all shabby and crumbly and, and make it kind of gross. And then, you know what, let's make, it, let's make it dirty even. Let's put it under my shoe and rub it around up here, you know, and stuff. And by the way, I'm not trying to be rude, but these shoes have been in the men's bathroom. So, you know, this, is, this has got to be pretty gross. And at this moment, if I said, who wants this $100 bill, how many of you would want it? See, see, <laughs> what is wrong with you? There's this $100 bill that's creased and smushed and dirty and cruddy is still worth $100. And I tell you that to say this. It doesn't matter in your life how much your life has been creased or damaged or smushed or dirtied or cruddied. You have never lost your value in God's, in God's eyes, ever. In fact, the Bible says that he bought us with a high price. And you determine the value of something by how much somebody is willing to pay for that. It doesn't matter what the books might tell you it's worth. It really comes down to what is somebody willing to pay. That becomes the value of that item. And what God paid for you and I with this high price, he built a bridge to you and I of the most costly material you can imagine, Jesus Christ. And in that, you begin to pick up on the value of people around us. It doesn't matter if you're in or if you're out. Nobody is excluded from this. This means everyone. The love of God is for everyone. This Savior is for everyone. This gospel that we have is for everyone. This church is for everyone. This love and this grace from God is for everyone. And it's for you and it's for me too. No one was more surprised by that message than a man by the name of Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus was one of the most feared men of his time. He had papers in his hand and permission to persecute any Christians that he came across. He could persecute them. He could have them arrested. He could have them stoned to death. And, and Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus. He was riding his horse when Jesus came to him. And I'm not talking about Jesus before in his ministry. I'm talking about Jesus after his death and after his resurrection. Jesus comes to Saul of Tarsus and says, I, you're my man. I want you in ministry. And in that moment, Saul of Tarsus would be so dramatically changed, his heart would be so transformed that he couldn't even wear the name Saul of Tarsus anymore. His name is changed to Paul, and we know him as the Apostle Paul. This is a message now that was going to so be ingrained in the Apostle Paul's heart that he now takes his message to everywhere, anyone. It, Jewish people, yes, he's willing to talk to Jewish people, but he's got this big heart for those who are outsiders, those who aren't, aren't a part of God's family, those who are so far removed. And it begs a question today is, how is your heart aligned with this message? Saul of Tarsus, who would have thought that he'd become the next great apostle? Who would have thought that Saul of Tarsus would become the next great evangelist? Who would have thought that Saul of Tarsus would become the next great Christian writer? Stop for a moment and consider that maybe, just maybe, the next great Christian leader might at this very moment still be a heathen. <laughs> might at this very moment still be a pagan. Might be an unbeliever. They might even be an atheist at this moment. 
that's the story of C.S. Lewis. He started out as an atheist, an unbeliever, an outsider. So did Chuck Colson. So did Lee Strobel. And some of you are going, I don't know any of those names. You might know these names. They started out the same way. Denzel Washington, Mark Wahlberg, Chuck Norris, Justine Bateman, supermodel Nikki Taylor, Kathy Lee Griffith, Johnny Cash, Dolly Parton, Chris Pratt, Faith Hill, Ryan Goslin, Tim McGraw, Tom Hanks, Keith Urban, and the list just goes on and on and on of people who started out as unbelievers, as some of them atheists, as some outsiders who now are followers of Jesus Christ and are very public about it. When you start thinking about the story of Jesus, it, 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 more often than not, you get tuned into the big events of their life, uh, his birth, his death, his resurrection. But there was this whole ministry of Jesus that was to outsiders. It was this how he interacted with people who were not part of the inward circle. Some of them had been pushed out. Some of them had been rejected. Some of them had been ignored for all kinds of reasons. And Jesus loved having a ministry to that kind of person, the outsider, so much so that it got him uh, criticism from the believers. Jesus wasn't put off by outsiders. Just think about it for a moment. A centurion soldier, one moment. The very next, a Samaritan woman at a well. Or dinner with a tax collector tonight. Tomorrow night, dinner with a prostitute. One minute, he's touching a leper with skin disease. The next, he's being touched by a woman with a blood issue. Face to face with a demon-possessed man today. Tomorrow, face to face with a woman caught in adultery. Every one of them pushed out over and over and over again, ignored those who had been rejected by the inner circle. And Jesus was placing high value on those outsiders. We're going through the book of Galatians this summer, and we titled the series Centered. Paul is trying to get the, church at, the churches at Galatia centered again in, in what's most important. And we talked about being centered on the gospel, and last week we talked about being centered on Christ. And today I get my heart re-centered on those who are still outside. I get my life centered on this message that this is for everyone. We do this study verse by verse. I'm going to give you some background. Stay with me for just a little bit, and I'm sure when I come out, you guys are really going to be uh, happy where this comes out. Let's begin. We're in Galatians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Paul writes to the church, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, I took Titus along also. Okay, now why is that important? Barnabas represents the Jews of that time, the Jewish uh, background, and Titus represents the Gentile background. He was a Greek. And here's Paul saying, I have this ministry to these two extremes. Barnabas was one of the first to, to befriend him. Barnabas was one of the first to go to the other apostles and say, hey, this Paul guy, he's for real. Yeah, but he persecuted Christians. That's not who he is anymore. Barnabas stood up for the apostle Paul and then joined him in ministry. If anybody could give the apostles a testimony for, for Paul, it's Barnabas. But he also brings his most recent, most uh, outstanding convert. This is one of his newest recruits. And Titus would go on in Christian ministry. There would be a book in your New Testament, by the way, titled the book of Titus. That's the same guy. His life is so transformed and so changed by Jesus, but Jesus is enough for him. And there's a group of people who came into the church who were trying to get the church to go back to Old Testament laws. You, you know, Jesus is fine, but you got to add this. It's Jesus plus this and plus this and plus this. Maybe you know ministries like that. Verse 2, he says, I went in response to a revelation. That means, you know, he, had a, 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 uh, he was moved by the Holy Spirit. He was meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. That's the apostles. And I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles, the unbelievers. I wanted to be sure that I was running and not had been running my race in vain. Verse 3, yet not even Titus, 
who was with me was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus to make us slaves. All right, there. I, I may have lost a whole bunch of you right there. Just hang on. That is some strong language from the Apostle Paul. He said they, they were false believers. They infiltrated the church. They came to spy on the freedoms that we have in Jesus Christ. And they were trying to put us back in the chains of the Old Testament. They were trying to make us slaves again. The Old Testament has tremendous value. There's great stories in the Old Testament. There's stories of, of great men and women of faith. But if you started today and said, I'm going to start practicing all of the stuff of the Old Testament, you'd be so far off track from what will eventually save you. It's Jesus only. And if we don't get our hearts centered back on the fact that you have to be connected to Christ in order to go to heaven, that has to be about Jesus, and we start adding all these Old Testament rules and laws, there's value in knowing them, don't get me wrong. But even some of us in this room, you're like, what, the Ten Commandments? I don't have to do the Ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments are great for ethics and moral and character, but you do not do those to go to heaven. The minute you go back in the Old Testament and you start putting on those chains again, Paul says you're going to be made a slave to the Old Testament again. Verse 5, we did not give in to them, that's the false teachers, even for a moment. So that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. There's the message. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. The disciples agreed with Paul in what he was preaching. Verse 7, on the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with a task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who is at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, he was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. Do you see that this is for everyone? Peter is preaching this gospel of Jesus to the Jews. Paul is preaching this to the Gentiles. By the way, Peter ministered to Gentiles, and Paul also ministered to Jews. That, it, it worked that way. But the main focus of their ministry was in these two categories. Verse 9, James, Cephas, meaning Peter, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, and they recognized the grace that was given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. And I, tell, I read all of that to tell you that the main message here, God doesn't show favoritism. This thing is for everyone. Now, how about you? How are you with unbelievers? How do you act around those outside the faith? Okay. This isn't a reprimand, but it is to keep us centered on what we're trying to do here. Not everything in this church is about you. We, we want you to come here. We feed, we feed our believers. We, uh, we want you to have good nourishment from God's word. We want you to be feeding on that and growing. And we are concerned about those who are Christians in our church. But you need to know that not everything that is done in this church, not every program that we run is about you. Sometimes it's about the outsider. Sometimes it's about the 10,000. If you haven't heard me say it yet, I'm going to say it again. We're a community of approximately 13,000 people. On any given Sunday, there's approximately 25 churches in town. And if all of us had a good number, I'm ta not talking about our Easter number, but just a good, good average Sunday number, there'd be about 3,000 people in church. That means there are 10,000 reasons in this community for this church to stay in business. There's 10,000 reasons in this community for you and I to be open to outsiders. For you and I to be open to a ministry of reaching to those who are not believers yet. And sometimes we as a church put together a program. We, we'll, we'll go off campus here. We'll go over to the chapel just to create a different atmosphere where maybe unbelievers might be uh, 
more interested in coming to because sometimes unbelievers don't want to step inside a church so okay we'll go over to the university and we'll meet there and sometimes when we do those kind of things it's our ministry sometimes focused on outsiders that get us the greatest criticism from those inside and it's not always about you this savior this gospel this church, this love, this grace is for everyone. And we're desperately trying to share it with everyone. We have 10,000 reasons to do this. I was afraid of getting criticized uh, years ago in ministry. I'm, I'm back up in Michigan for a moment, but a couple came and asked me to do their wedding. And, and, and they weren't really believers, but they had been introduced to me and they really wanted me and and uh but here was the catch they didn't want to do their wedding in uh the church they were motorcycle bikers and uh they wanted me to do their wedding at a biker rally I, now i'm gonna t i've never been to a biker rally before this month but i told him i said oh man i don't know i said can i think about this for a day and and the next morning he came right to my office he said this is really important to us we really want you we like you and we want you and and i said all right i'm gonna do this thing because I had hope that there would be a door of opportunity there with them. And so I drove up to this farm where this biker rally was going to be, and I'd leave my car out on the street, and, and this guy came out, and he picked me up on his motorcycle. I rode in on this Harley. And when I got in there, there was this circle of about 200-plus motorcycles, Harleys, all of them, in the circle, and, and, and we rode right in the middle, and that's where the wedding was going to be held. Oh, I didn't tell you. I, I don't remember their names, uh, but their biker names was, his biker name was Dog, and her biker name was Nightmare. <laughs> you know, do you, Dog, take Nightmare to be biker babes? Or, you know, I, uh, <laughs> and, and to the young guys in the room, <laughs> don't, don't marry a girl with a nickname Nightmare. I'm just telling you, that, that doesn't go well. But anyway, so I'm thrown into this environment, and, uh, I did the wedding, and when I pronounced them uh, husband and wife, all those motorcycles started up. I mean, just thunder, just revved as loud as they could. It was just pure thunder and applause, and it was just crazy. And, and afterwards, we stand around, and they had made cake for, like, this whole group. There was just cake going everywhere, and I'm standing there just wondering what, what I had done. And, uh, <laughs> and a young lady came up to me. Her name was Rachel. And... Uh, she was complimentary, and she said, uh, she said, I used to go to church with my grandma before she passed away. I said, I bet you miss your grandma. She said, I do. I said, is there any chance you miss church? And she smiled. She said, I do. I said, well, the doors are always open where I minister. Any Sunday, you'd be welcome there. We'd love to have you. And then this group off to the side that I, I could tell they were watching me closely um, they came up, they had overheard my conversation with Rachel and they were pleased that I had come to do the way. And they identified themselves, they were part of the, the Christian Bikers Association. I didn't know anything about the Christian Bikers o Association before that. But, you know, they were a group of believers just hanging out with other bikers, you know. And their patch, their colors on their back said Christian Bikers Association. And, and uh, I was just trying to make small talk with them. And the, the chapter president, I said to Paul, I said... Uh, I said, boy, this is a sleazy place for us to be, isn't it? And he said, you know, I've always thought that if Jesus were living today, this is exactly where he'd be hanging out. <laughs> it just pierced my heart. I knew that I had gotten off track from where Jesus wanted me to be. And I was exactly where I should have been. Now, I'd love to tell you that the ministry to Dog and Nightmare really flourished. It didn't. It didn't. But the next Sunday, in came a dozen motorcycles from the Christian Bikers Association. <laughs> they came in on their motorcycles. They had their colors on, their vests and leather. They freaked out my church. It was awesome. <laughs> and they're like walking in, we're with the pastor. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> And, and with them was Rachel. Over time, a whole bunch of them became members of our church. 
There's, there's a good chance some of them still follow my sermons. There's a good chance they're going to hear their names. Bob and Crystal became a part of our ministry. Paul and Julie became a part of our ministry. Chris and Mike became a part of our ministry, all part of the Christian Motorcycles Association. And Rachel became a regular attender for a long time with us. <laughs> I, when I'm open to outsiders, God is willing to use a person like that. And stories like that in my life could be stories like that in your life, too. This thing that we do is for everyone. The love of God is for everyone. God's love is for the frat boys and for girls gone wild. God's love is for the church goer and for those who have never stepped inside the church. His love is for those with special needs and for those who are victims and those who are in mansions. His love is for hell's angels and gang members and drug dealers and addicts. But his love is also for the farmer and the stockbroker and the medical personnel and the dock workers and the shop workers and the plumbers and the carpenters. His love is for the policemen and the rescue workers and the seminary student. His love is for those with a secret life and his love is for those who have a stagnant faith. His love is for the factory workers and the tattoo parlor owners and his love is for the abortion clinic personnel. His love is for Republicans and Democrats and independents. His love is for families that are falling apart and for families who come here every Sunday pretending that they got it all together. His love is for the divorcee or singles living together, the ones with same-sex attractions. His love is for everyone. His love is for me and his love is for you. That does not mean that we have to agree with every life decision they make. That does not mean that I, have to, that I can't speak the truth regarding wrong lifestyles. That does not mean that I have to bend my morals or that I have to forfeit my convictions. All it means is that I have to love them as much as God loves them. doesn't matter where you are on your spiritual journey today. doesn't matter how dirty or creased or crumpled or stained or mistreated you are. Jesus is ready to come alongside of you and join you right now, right where you are. Because this Savior is for everyone. And this gospel is for everyone. And this church is for everyone. And this love and grace is for everyone. And you and I have 10,000 reasons to take that heart and that message outside of this room and into this community. God loves them. The question is, do you love them? 